Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Eric Priest, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this third of 12 James Gregory lectures over a four-year period. These are sponsored by the John Templeton Foundation uh, and also the Scotsman newspaper. James Gregory, as many of you may know, was uh, one of the most famous scientists ever to have been in St Andrews. He was here in the 17th century. And there's some fantastic banners here that give details of his life and work. And you can have a look at them um, at the end of the lecture if you'd like. Um, and you can also, you're always, also very welcome to attend the reception that we're going to hold in the, the foyer of the Yanka Hall and out there. You'll have a chance to uh, discuss with our speaker there. Um, the programme for next session, we've been working on this uh, very hard. Um, and in October, John Bottlemore is going to come and talk about the interaction of God with the world and the whole question of the problem of suffering. Uh, and then in February, um, I had lunch last week with Richard Dawkins and was asking him if he'd like to come up and debate the whole question as to whether or not God is an illusion with one or two other people. Um, and he's at the moment thinking about it. So that's why there's a, a question mark there. So I'm not sure whether or not he's going to come. Um, and then in April, we have uh, Kenneth Miller, um, an eminent a uh, microbiologist uh, from Brown University who's going to talk about, uh, essentially about evolution and the nature of life. So that looks really exciting. I recommend you have a look at uh, the website for the lecture series um, and on that you can see copies of the previous lectures, uh, copies also of the discussions that we hold in the evening after the lecture at the dinner with the, the speaker um, and also there's a, a web forum um, on which you can post uh, any questions you like. If you don't get a chance to answer any questions you have this evening, then you can post them on the web forum or if uh, you think of questions later on. Um, and also um, Bruno uh, Guidagoni um, here is the uh, director of the Lyon Observatory. Um, he's a leading cosmologist. Um, and I've, I've just been delighted to, to meet him today. I, I really feel he's a, a kindred spirit. Um, he presented a series of weekly programs on French television uh, called Knowing Islam for about six years. Um, and he runs an international uh, research program on science and religion in Islam, which is meant to bring together scientists in France who are also Muslims I was particularly keen uh, to hold um, a lecture on this uh, subject this year because for me, personally, Islam and Christianity are sister religions and we need to work hard to understand each other much better than we do at the moment um, so that we can work together for peace in the world in, in this century. And I feel that's a, a really important um, aim. Uh, so please welcome Bruno Guidadoni to give the third James Gregory Lecture on Science and Islam. Islam, 
as a key for the reading of a text and for subsequent action inspired from this reading. The whole revelation of the Quran comes from God the One through His names of love and mercy. It sounds quite simple indeed. Unfortunately, one must admit that what actually happens is far from these principles. Of course, everybody would agree that there is a gap between principles and realities, between what religion should be and what the members of this religion make of it, between the realm of spiritual tenets and the vicissitudes of history. But is there a specific issue with Islam? Many voices are heard that put the Islamic faith on trial. It is a fact that, in contrast with other cultural zones, the Islamic world seems to participate very little in the scientific pursuit of today and to be struck by recurrent social and political disorders. Several authors have attributed these two facts to the same cause, the presumed inability of the Islamic faith to establish a sound relationship with the practice of reason and consequently to enforce reasonable behaviors in societies. Here comes a point I would like to address with your permission in this lecture from the specific viewpoint of a Western Muslim who happens to be a professional scientist. Does Islam, because of its very principle, face an insuperable difficulty with the methods and results of science? As it a specific problem with the practice of reason that would entail the possibility for Muslims to adopt reasonable behaviors in modern societies? In a single sentence, is it possible to be a coherent Muslim and to participate constructively in the endeavors of our common world and, first of all, in science? I would like to hereafter argue that although ignorance, hate and violence unfortunately exist in the Islamic world, the spiritual tenets and the intellectual resources of the Islamic faith actually prompt Muslims to search for knowledge, law, and peace. My lecture will be divided into three parts. First, I will summarize the basic principles of the Islamic faith that appear relevant to understanding the nature of knowledge in the Islamic perspective. Second, I will briefly review a few historical and contemporary positions about the relation between faith and reason and between religion and science. Third, I will try to defend the viewpoint in which faith, although it does not say anything about the specific content of science, offers a broad metaphysical background that helps me, as a scientist, find purpose and meaning in its discoveries. Finally, I will conclude by a new examination of the above-mentioned issue, the organization of society and the dialogue of faith and cultures. It turns out that this metaphysical background also helps us find purpose and meaning in the diversity of faiths, as well as it gives us guidelines for a peaceful coexistence in this world. The presumed difficulty that Islam faces in its relationship with reason was recently summarized with great talent and large impact by the famous lecture given by Pope Benedict XVI in Regensburg on September 18th, 2006, in front of an audience of representatives of science. In an attempt to propose a new vision to secularize Europe, the Holy Pope explained what he considered a specific feature of Christianity. For him, it is not surprising that modern science and reasonable behaviors developed in countries where Christianity was predominant because of the convergence of the Logos as Greek reason with the Logos as God's speech in the Gospel of John. As a matter of fact, this lecture triggered strong reactions in the Islamic world because Islam was used by the Pope as a sort of counterexample, a religion in which the absence of reason and the presence of violence are closely interwoven. According to the Pope, for Muslim teaching, God is absolutely transcendent. His will is not bound up with any of our categories, even that of rationality. After this Regensburg lecture, there were exchanges between the Islamic world and the Holy See, 
requests of apologies on one side and statements that the lecture was misunderstood on the other side. Here, I would like to address the issue raised by the Holy Father very much where he left it, and to answer positively to the calls for dialogue that were eventually heard on both sides. As a matter of fact, I think the issue stems from the idea we have about God. When the Pope writes, after many authors, for Muslim teaching, God is absolutely transcendent, he understands this sentence in the following way. For Muslims, God is only transcendent. But is the God of Islam different from the God of Christianity? It is not the Muslim's opinion. For them, Allah, a word that etymologically means the God, is not the name of a Muslim's God. It is the Arabic name of the one God, the God of all humanity, worshipped by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. For Islam, as much as for Judaism and Christianity, God is absolutely transcendent, and he is perfectly immanent too. It means that he cannot be known by any of our categories, and simultaneously, he is close to us. He acts in the world. He knows and loves us. He lets him be known and be loved by us. As the Quran says, nothing is similar to him, and he is the one who perfectly hears and knows. God gathers aspects that are contradictory. He is the first and the last, the apparent and the hidden, and he is closer to us than our jubilar pain, according to the text of the Quran. This coexistence of, of two aspects is necessary in a monotheistic religion to prevent our idea about God from becoming an idol. In Islamic terms, one would say that it is necessary that a statement about the oneness of God, of God requires the statement that God is like nothing else and the statement that his name, attributes and actions can be compared with what happened in the world. A God who is only transcendent is an abstract concept, and a God who is only immanent is nothing else than a form of cosmic energy. One can readily understand that the issue of the intelligibility of God's attributes and action, and the extension of the domain where reason can apply to no religion and to no science, strongly depend on the balance between transcendence and immanence. It is true that extreme standpoints did exist in Islamic thinking, in one direction or another. However, the mainstream defended the simultaneous existence of these two aspects and the fact that immanence is possible because God is so transcendent that his transcendence is unaffected by his presence in the world close to us. God created the world. This sentence means that the world is not self-sufficient. The world may not have been there, but it actually is there. And the explanation provided by religions is that the being of the world is given by another being who is not a being like the others, but rather the action of being itself. God also revealed himself in the world through specific moments in which infinity gets in contact with the finite eternity with the temple. These moments they give birth to new religions that in Islamic perspective are only new adaptations of the same universal truth to new peoples and to the languages of these peoples. And God has a specific contact with each of the human beings whom he cares after and inspires. Islam is the third come of the monotheistic religions in the way of the promise made to Abraham by God after Judaism and Christianity. Remember the story of the book of Genesis when Abraham obeys God's order and leaves his wife Hagar and his son Ishmael in the desert. For Muslims, the place where Hagar and Ishmael were left is the valley of Bakr where the temple that was given by God to Adam after the fall from Eden used to be located before the deluge. Later, Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt the temple, a small cubic building covered by the black veil, now in the great mosque of Mecca. 
This building is empty and only inhabited by what is called the Sakina, the mysterious and sacred presence of God, which is quite paradoxical because God is everywhere and still he specifically manifests in some places. Islam brings the renewal of his Abrahamic faith through a new revelation that is an initial miracle that founds a new relation of a part of humankind with God. This initial miracle is the revelation of a text, the Holy Quran, to a human being, Prophet Muhammad, who was born in Mecca at the end of the 6th century. The revelation started during the night of destiny and lasted 20 years till the Prophet's death in 632. What exactly is this miracle? For Muslims, the miracle is the fact that not only the meanings of the Holy Quran which, were, which was brought to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel. Not only these meanings come from God, but also the choice of the words, the sentences, the chapters in a given human language, the, the Arabic language, in such a way that the divine speech can be heard, pronounced, and understood by the human. As a faithful messenger, Muhammad did not add nor cut a single word of the holy reading or proclamation, that's the meaning of the word Quran, but subsequently became a group and acquired its final appearance under Uthman's caliphate a few years before, after, the, after the Prophet's death. Of course, the Arabic language almost breaks down under the way of a divine speech. There are subtleties, the use of an uncommon vocabulary separated letters that may convey mysterious information. The Arabic words frequently have several meanings, and the task of commentators is to highlight the richness of the teachings that a single verse can bring forth. The prophet himself mentioned the multiplicity of the meanings of the Quran by saying that each verse has an outer meaning and an inner meaning, a juridical meaning, and a place of ascension, that is, a direct spiritual influence of the reader. This plurality of meanings makes the task of the translator quite uneasy because this plurality does not transfer directly into other languages and especially into European languages. Another fascinating aspect of the Quran is the fact that it gathers messages about the divine names, attributes and actions, prescriptions and prohibitions from God, stories of the prophets, descriptions of this lower world and of the hereafter, ethical advice and chronicles of the life of the first Islamic community around the prophet. But all these chains are more or less mixed up or interlaced in each of the 114 chapters in such a way that the internal coherence can be found only after reading and rereading the text, which progressively sheds light on itself. The miracle of the descent of the Quran reproduces the miracle of creation. God creates things through his speech, with his order, could be. The creatures receive their existence from God who will, through his order. God subsequently unveils hidden knowledge, again through his speech with another of his orders. Read, Ikra, the first word of the Quran given to Prophet Muhammad. This instruction speaks to the reader, the human being who uses his, 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 his intelligence to understand the holy text. As a consequence, the Quran is like a second creation, a book where God shows his signs or verses, ayat, very much as we contemplate God's signs, ayat, in the entities and phenomena of the first creation. God unveiled the book of religion, very much as he created the book of existence. The issue of the relationship of faith with science specifically deals with the coherence between the first and the second book. This topic of the Liber Scripture and the Liber Mundi is expressed in similar terms in other faiths. Islam manifests itself as a renewal of the faith of Abraham, as a new adaptation of the same universal truth that was given to Adam, first human being, first sinner, first repentant, first forgiven human, and first prophet. Muhammad comes as the last prophet after a long chain that includes many prophets of the Bible, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Moses, David, and Solomon, as well as John the Baptist and Jesus, upon them the peace.
The Quran also includes stories about other prophets that are not known by the biblical tradition and were sent to the Arabs or maybe to other peoples in Asia. Hence, the fundamental formula of Islam, the so-called profession of faith or shahada, that is the first of the five pillars of Islam, which is written in Arabic on this slide, there is no God but God and Muhammad is God's messenger. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasul. The message is the Quran, the message from God that prompts the Muslims to be faithful to their own spiritual vocation. The second pillar of Islam is the canonical prayer performed five times a day at specific moments linked to cosmic events before sunrise, afternoon, in the middle of the afternoon, after sunset, and when night is dark. The third pillar is almsgiving on accumulated wealth. The fourth pillar is ritual fasting during the month of Ramadan, the month during which the first verses of the Quran were revealed, from the first light of the day to sunset. And finally, the fifth and last pillar is a pilgrimage to the house of God, the Kaaba, and some places around Mecca. These five pillars constitute reference points for the actions of worship. This is the most important part of a religious law of Sharia. The Sharia also includes a description of many aspects of the social life. There are only few Quranic verses that actually deal with social organization, but in the time of the first Islamic community, the presence of the Prophet allowed it to solve all issues. Later, when Islam became a religion of a vast empire, it became necessary to have a more complete codification of the religious law, and the so-called classical Sharia was slowly constituted. Muslims now need to re-examine this issue in the context that is much more complex in societies which are shaped by science and technology, globalization, exchanges of people and information, and the presence of many minorities. It is a great challenge for Muslims, and a strong effort of interpretation that is called each jihad is necessary. Jews, Christians, Jews and Christians were present in Arab Arabia during the time of the Quranic revelation. And the Quran alludes to the exchanges that they had with Prophet Muhammad. It turned out that these exchanges had the following outcome. The majority of the Jews and Christians did not acknowledge Prophet Muhammad and Islam became a religion clearly and completely separated from Judaism and Christianity. The main difference with Judaism is the fact that Islam, like Christianity, is a religion that is explicitly universal. Its message speaks to all the humankind, whereas Judaism is linked to a given people. The main difference with Christianity is the disagreement about the nature of Jesus. Jesus is present in the Quran as an Islamic prophet who came to bring the message on the oneness of God, but he is a very unusual prophet. He was born miraculously from Maria the Virgin, who herself was protected against any sin. The angel Gabriel announced Jesus' birth to Maria. For Muslims, Jesus is the Christ, and Masih, the anointed by the Lord. He spoke out with wisdom just after his birth, and made miracles with God's permission. He miraculously escaped from death, and he is still alive beside God. Muslims say that Jesus is a spirit of God and a word from God. Allah, Allah. But they do not say that Jesus is God's son. They do not say that Jesus is God's son. If they were to say so, they would be Christians. And Islam would be only one more Christian church. As a consequence, for Islam there is no incarnation, no trinity, no crucifixion, and no redemption. And in any case, no crime of our sin that would make redemption for the human kind necessary. It is true that Jews differ from Christians also about the figure of Jesus. Apart from this central figure, the three monotheistic religions have a lot in common. The one God, the creation of the world, the creation of a human being according to God's image and likeness, we Muslims say according to the form of the merciful, the call for spiritual life, for helping the poor, and the belief that the human being, despite his sins, can improve and be saved. I mean, it's fair to say that even if Jesus currently separates Jews, Christians, and Muslims, he will eventually reunite them in a horizon that is at the end of times. Muslims consider that Jesus is the sign of ultimate power and that he will come to gather the believers of all religions. As a matter of fact, Christians say the same thing about Jesus and Jews wait for the Messiah. It's a great mystery. 
that these believers who say things that are so different about the Messiah will eventually recognize and follow him. According to a constant teaching of Islamic tradition, and because of the specific status of holy texts of Islam as the fundamental axis of revelation, faith is intimately linked to knowledge. The famous Quranic verse prescribes, Worship your Lord till certainty, and many prophetic sayings strongly recommend the pursuit of knowledge as a religious duty incumbent to all Muslims. The prophet himself used to say, My Lord, increase my knowledge. Of course, this knowledge consists in knowing God through revelation, but it's clear too that all sorts of knowledge that can be in some way connected to God and can help the religious and mundane life of society are good and have to be pursued. Clearly, when the prophet recommended that his companions search for knowledge as far as China, he did not allude primarily to religious knowledge. Human beings have a faculty of knowing what is described in the Quran according to a threefold aspect. Uh, hearing is our faculty of accepting and obeying the textual indication, that is the Quran and the prophetic tradition, which are the two primary sources of religious knowledge. Sight is our ability to ponder and reflect upon the phenomenon and is closely related to the rational pursuit of knowledge. And the inner vision, symbolically located in the heart, is the possibility of receiving knowledge directly from God through spiritual unveiling. As a consequence of these three facets, the nature of knowledge is also threefold. It is religious for the study of the Holy Scriptures and the submission to their prescriptions and prohibition, rational through the investigation of the world and reflection upon it, and mystical through inner enlightenment, directly granted by God to whom ever he wishes among his servants. Moreover, there is a well-known story about the independence of natural rules with respect to religious teachings. Farmers who used to grow dead palms asked the prophet whether it was necessary to graft these dead palms. The prophet answered no, and they followed his advice. Then they complained that the dead crops were very bad. The prophet answered that he was only a human like them. He said, you are more knowledgeable than I in the best interests of this world of yours. But this is very, very important. There is a domain in which religion simply has nothing to say, a domain that is neutral with respect to the ritual and ethical teachings of revelation. However, because Islam does not separate the intellectual aspects of life from ethical concerns, the only knowledge that should be avoided is useless knowledge, that is, the knowledge that closes our eyes to the treasures of our own spiritual vocation. To summarize the descent of the Quran, in which God unveils his transcendence and, in, and his immanence, provides the Muslims with a way to celebrate God's mystery, as well as to approach his intelligibility. This intelligibility requires the use of reason, encapsulated in a broader perspective of knowledge. Through these explanations and promises, God chooses to be partly bound by the categories of reason, out of his mercy and love for the world. But reason itself is unable to approach all the truth because truth is not only conceptual, it also involves all the being. In the Islamic perspective, the intellect precisely includes the practice of reason and the lucidity to understand where reason ceases to be efficient in this quest. The question of the exact extension of the domain of reason has been debated, and I will now try to illustrate the type of debates that took place in Islamic thinking. After the extension of the Islamic Empire, the Islamic thought met Greek science and philosophy. At that time, it became necessary to define more accurately the place of rational knowledge in the religious pursuit by marking the field that we can validly explore with our own reason. The great thinker Al Ghazali, known in the West as Al Ghazali, examined the relation between science and philosophy on the one hand, religion on the other. As all his predecessors, he had a strong belief that there is only one truth and that well-guided reason cannot be in contradiction with textual indications given by the Quran prophetic tradition. However, Al-Razali writes, there is a risk in the practice of sciences. On the one hand, because scientists may be too proud of themselves, they often adventure beyond the field where reason can validly apply, and they make metaphysical or theological statements about God and religious issues that happen to contradict textual indications. On the other hand, the common believers, after seeing the excesses of the scientists, are led to reject 
all science, all science is indiscriminate. I'll rather be condemned those who believe they defend Islam by rejecting the philosophical sciences and actually cause much damage to it. That's a quotation. Now, providing there is only one proof how to deal with possible contradictions between science and Quranic verses, the situation is clear for al -Razali. Wherever science apparently contradicts textual indications, it's the fault of the scientists who surely have made errors in their scientific works as far as they have been led to conclusions which are at all with revealed the truth. Almost a century later, in Brust, known in the West as Abbe Royce, examines again the issue addressed by al Razali. In Brust was a judge, and this text is indeed what is called a juridical pronouncement, a fatwa, to establish whether the study of philosophy and logic is allowed by the revealed law, or condemned by it, or prescribed, either as recommended or as mandatory. As a matter of fact, for our heroes, the religious law makes philosophy and science mandatory. Now, in Bush wrote, I quote, since this revelation, the Quran is true and prompts to practicing rational examination, which leads to the knowledge of truth, we Muslims know with certainty that rational examination will never contradict the teachings of a meaning text, because truth cannot contradict truth, but agrees with it and supports it. As a consequence, Imbrush explains that wherever the results of rational examination contradict the textual indications, this contradiction is only apparent, and the text has to be submitted to allegorical interpretation. The Islamic world met modern science during the 19th century as a double challenge, a material one as a, and an intellectual one. The defense of the Ottoman Empire in front of the military invasion brought by Western countries and the success of colonization have made the acquisition of Western technology necessary and also Western science, which is the foundation of the latter. The West appeared as a model of progress which has to be reached, or at least followed, by a constant effort of training engineers and technicians and by transferring the technology that is required to develop third world countries. But the encounter between Islam and modern science also gave birth to a reflection and even a controversy, the nature of which is philosophical doctrine. To cut a long story short, the Islamic world now has a great interest in science. But a lot of disagreement about what science is or has to be, to be fully incorporated into Islamic societies by being made Islamic. For the modernist dream, Islamic science is only universal science practiced by scientists who happen to be Muslims. For the reconstruction stream, Islamic science has to be rebuilt from Islamic principles in the prospect of the needs of Islamic societies. For the traditional stream, Islamic science is the ancient symbolic science that has to be recovered in a prospect that is more respectful of the nature and of the spiritual pursuit of the scientists. The various streams of the contemporary Islamic thought show an intense activity on the relationship between science and religion. All of them have to identify pitfalls in their path. The main issue is that they are conceptions that are elaborated a priori as mental representations of the activity of Muslim scientists, and they have little to do with the actual practice in laboratories. If I were to comment on these streams, I would say that each of them saves or emphasizes or captures a part of the situation. Yes, it is true that science in its methods and philosophy is largely universal and the common property of humankind. Yes, it is true that science cannot be decoupled from the society in which it develops and that the way it is organized, the topics that are highlighted, the ethic that is practiced, are influenced by the work of scientists. Yes, it is true that even if science describes the material cosmos with great success, the issue of meaning and purpose and the inclusion of the scientific pursuit in a broader quest for knowledge have to be considered by scientists who are believers. As a matter of fact, most of the debates between science and religion in the Islamic perspective simply forget from that starting point that is the nature of the knowledge brought forth by the Quranic revelation. As it is explained already in the first verses that descended on Prophet Muhammad during the night of destiny, God speaks to the human to teach it what doesn't know. I quote the Quran. Iqra, read in the name of your Lord but who created. He created the human from the clot of blood. Read 
and your world is the most bountiful who taught the use of a pen and taught the human that which he knew not, and taught the human that which he knew not. The teachings of the Quran primarily consist in highlighting the spiritual vocation of the human being, the purpose of creation, and the mysteries of the hereafter. They speak mostly of what to do to it righteously and to hope to be saved. These teachings are proposed under the veils of myths and symbols. Here we must give these words a strong meaning. Myths and symbols in holy texts are not simple allegories. The language of the mutus conveys meanings that cannot be expressed otherwise, that is, in the language of the logos, the language of articulated and clear demonstrations. Myths and symbols are just like fingers that point to realities that would be otherwise beyond our attention. They just call for the meaning they allude to, to knowledge that is obtained by intuition in relationship and resonance with the contemplation of the symbols. In some sense, all ritual actions are like symbols that bring spiritual influence. In this view, it is possible to avoid a literalistic reading of a text and to focus on spiritual realities. The verses of heavens do not speak of astronomy, but of, uh, but of the upper levels of being inhabited by intellectual realities, as much as the chronicles of the wars and struggles of the first Muslims uh, with the pagans do not speak of general rules of a re relation of Muslims with non-Muslims, but of the symbols of the greatest effort, which is the struggle against our own passions that darken our souls. Let me now propose a view on how the articulation between modern science and religion can be addressed in the Islamic tradition. I would like to suggest that the theological and metaphysical corpus of Islamic thought is rich enough to help the Muslim scientists of today find meaning in the world as it is described by the current scientific inquiry. Of course, I'm not going to propose a new form of parallelism. I will rather speak in terms of convergence. Reality uncovered by modern science can fit the broader metaphysical stage. I will only give four examples on how this convergence can take place. First, the intelligibility of the world. The fundamental mystery that sustains physics and cosmology is the fact that the world is intelligible. For the Islamic tradition, this intelligibility is part of the divine plans for the world, since God, who knows everything, created both the world and the human from his intelligence. Then he put intelligence in the human. By looking at the cosmos, our intelligence constantly meets his intelligence. The fact that God is one guarantees the unity of the human and the cosmos and the adequacy of our intelligence to understanding at least part of the world. The Quran mentions the regularities that are present in the world. I quote the Quran, you will find no change in God's custom, or there is no change in God's creation. Clearly, that does not mean that creation is immutable, since in many verses the Quran emphasizes the changes we see in the sky and on earth. These verses mean that there is a stability in creation that reflects God's immutability. Moreover, these regularities that are consequences of God's will can be qualified as mathematical regularities. Several verses draw the reader's attention to the numerical order that is present in the cosmos. The sun and the moon are ordered according to an exact computation. How does God act in creation? According to mainstream Islamic theology, God does not act by fixing the laws of physics and initial conditions and letting the world evolve mechanistically. As a matter of fact, God, as the primary cause, does not cease to create the world again and again. In this continuous renewal of creation, the atoms and their accidents are created anew at each time. The regularities that we observe in the world are not due to causal connection, but to a constant conjunction between the phenomena, which is a habit of custom established by God's will. The examination of causality Aristotelian causality by the Islamic tradition emphasizes the metaphysical mystery of the continuous validity of the laws. All that dwells upon the earth is evanescent, the Quran says, and should fall back into nothingness. But the relative permanence of cosmic phenomena is, root, is rooted in God's absolute immutability. In any case, this metaphysical criticism of causality 
did not hamper the development of the Islamic science at the same epoch. On the contrary, the criticism of the Aristotelian conception of the cause as mere condition for effects to occur necessarily and immediately opened the way to a deeper examination of the world to determine what the habit or custom proposed by God actually was in the real world and not in our field. Deductive thinking that goes from causes to effects cannot be used a priori as it was in the Aristotelian philosophy in the realm of nature. One has to observe what is actually happening in the world to discover God's will. The development of science in Islam during the great classical period was closely linked to the will to look at phenomena to understand God's will. God praises and loves diversity. One fundamental element of Islamic doctrine is the fact that God praises and loves diversity. As a matter of fact, God never ceases to create because of his love, his Ramah, a word that etymologically alludes to the maternal womb. The mother's love for her children is the best symbol of his divine love on earth, according to a prophetic teaching which says that God created 100 parts of his Ramah and he kept 99 parts with him while letting one part is on earth, and it is with this part on earth that all mothers care after their children. The divine love reaches the diversity of creatures, physical phenomena, plants, animals, as well as the human diversity of ethnical types, languages, cultures, and extends to the diversity of religions, according to the well-known Quranic verse, and if God had wanted, he could surely have made you all one, I have made you all one single community, but he will otherwise, in order to test you by means of what he has given to you. By then, with one another in doing good works, and to God you all must return, and then he will make you truly understand all that on which you are different. For a Muslim scientist, uh, of course, it's easy to appreciate this love of diversity in the meditation and the results of modern science. I like to uh, see connection between this representation of a world and the tremendous diversity of things which are turning around the center with this other image that you may know, which is the image of galaxies, of the universe of galaxies. 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Each galaxy consists in typically one to one thousand billion stars. And it is very likely that each of these stars is surrounded by several planets, which themselves may have satellites. This makes an incredible number of planets to which one must connect the fact that differential evolution gives each planet a specific identity that doesn't resemble to the others. Of course, we do not know how much of these planets actually are the life forms, but astrophysicists cannot contemplate these large numbers of billions and billions of galaxies and stars without thinking that life probably exists elsewhere in the universe. Only on Earth, there are millions of life species. Can one, of living species, sorry, can one imagine that he, what the observable universe is? And the patch of the universe where this observable universe, which is probed by the telescopes, is located, is much larger probably, by a factor of many millions. And this patch of the universe may be itself encapsulated in an infinite multiverse in which the laws of physics and the properties of the outcomes greatly varies from patch to patch. What is the meaning of that all? A believer can read the creativity and love of God in this landscape. Love is the explanation of creation according to a tradition where God says, I was a hidden treasure, I loved to be known, so I created the creatures to be known by them. Fourth, the last point, science cannot be separated from heaven. According to the Islamic doctrine, a human being is created from clay, from God's spirit, to become God's vice regent on earth. The human being is the only creature that is able to know God through all his names and attributes, and it is put on earth as a garden keeper of the garden. Our relationship with other uh, living creatures on earth is not but from the upper to the lower level, with a concomitant possibility to exploit all inferior beings, but but from the central to the peripheral. The central position of the garden keeper on earth is the position of the watchman who equally cares after all the inhabitants of the garden. This implies a sense of accountability for all creation and should lead to humility, not to arrogance. 
As a consequence, we can eat the fruits of the garden, but we have no right whatsoever to approve the trees which do not belong to us. The power that science has given to us must be accompanied by a greater sense of the ethic that is necessary to use this power with discrimination and intelligence. To say the things in a few words, we must not do all what we can do. Very much as Adam was not allowed to touch one specific tree in the garden. This prohibition takes us free because freedom requires the possibility of choice. The symbol of the garden keeper in the garden is a strong book today with the current debates on how to deal with global warming, the share of natural resources in a sustainable way of a preservation of biodiversity. And just to illustrate this uh, thing, I show you this very nice image of Eden in which he gives a flower to Adam. Now I come to my, to my conclusion. The Islamic tradition has a considerable spiritual and intellectual legacy that should make it contribute to the building of the 21st century. We do hope that the human kind will find a paradigm for its diversity within a strong sense of its unity. Unfortunately, there are also forces of darkness and ignorance that operate in our world. Instead of diversity, we see fragmentation. Instead of unity, we see uniformity. The believers have their share of responsibility in this tragedy because they do not promote a genuine sense of all religious truth. What has the debate between science and religion to do with that? I think that the, the idea that God wrote two books, the books, the book of creation and the book of scripture, with the certainty that these books are in fundamental agreement in spite of apparent discrepancies, can prepare us to the idea that God has written or revealed many books of scriptures that are also in fundamental agreement in spite of apparent discrepancies. As far as the solution of these discrepancies is concerned, we must live with some tension while praising the Lord for the marvelous diversity he created and revealed. In conclusion, let me address the issue of ultimate truth and tell you a brief and profound story that illustrates the mystery of the human condition. We have to go back to the past again and look at the Imbrust. Around uh, 1180, Imbrust was informed, however, was informed that a young man called Mohyeddin in Arabi, aged about 15, was granted spiritual opening during his retreats. In Imbrust, who was a greater philosopher of his time, invited this youngster to meet him. Later, in Arabi, who then was considered the greater master of Islamic mysticism, wrote about the story of the meeting in the introduction of his major book, The Meccan of the Meeting of Futuhad and Akira, a 4,000 page treatise that unveils the contents of his spiritual intuitions. I just let him have speak. When I entered in upon him, Bush, he stood up out of love and respect. He embraced me and said, Yes! I said, Yes! His joy increased because I had understood him. Then I realized why he had rejoiced at that. So I said, no. His joy disappeared and his color changed and adopted what he possessed in himself. This is a very strange dialogue indeed. Then in Arabi gives us the key of these strange exchanges in which answers come before the questions. In Bush, addresses the central topic of our lecture of this evening. How did you find the situation in the day and divine fusion? Is it what rational consideration gives to us? In Arabi replied, Amla, yes, no. Between the yes and the no, spirits fly from their matter and heads from their bodies. In Arabi reports in Rush's reaction, reaction to these words, his color turned pale and he began to tremble. He starts reciting La Hawla wa Quwwata illa Billah, that is, there is no power and no strength but in God, since he has understood my illusion. As a matter of fact, Ibn Arabi answers yes, because science can do a lot of things. And he answers yes, no, because he alludes to eschatology by recalling that even if reason can go very far to capture reality, no one has been intimately changed by scientific knowledge. Knowing Gödel's theorem, quantum physics, or the standard hot big model changes our worldview 
and maybe the way our minds work, but it does not change our hearts. Of course, these discoveries are fundamental milestones in intellectual history. They can produce strong feelings in those who dedicate their lives to such studies, but Revelation speaks of another degree or intensity of truth that changes our very being and prepares it for the mystery of the afterlife. The teaching of origins is that we shall have to leave this world and enter another level of being to pursue our quest for knowledge in a broader locus more fitted to contemplating God than our now physical world. Our reason fails to conceive how it is possible. It is a matter of faith in the promises of our holy scriptures and at that time it's better to stop speaking because as the poet and mystic Geraldine Rumi used to say, the pen, when it reaches this point, just breaks. Should do that. And that. Thank you very much. Something which is very strange, and of course, 
is just, it is just feeling, it's just kind of knowledge which is not very, very objective. But this is a mystery. So I cannot answer the, the question in a very uh, accurate way. My feeling is that the answer is yes, these levels of reality actually have some, some existence, some objective existence, even if they are beyond our grasp for most of us and most of the time. I'm Alison Wine, but I live in St. Andrews. Um, I'm interested to know if Islam has any attitude towards stem cell research. I am not an expert in bioethics. What I can say is that, uh, with respect to Christianity, for instance, there is not the idea that, that because of the very principles of the very tenets of the of Islam, uh, biology, the biological level of the human being is sacred. I think it comes in Christianity, or at least in Roman Catholicism, Catholicism mostly of the, from the doctrine of incarnation. The idea that from the beginning, the human being is present even because the flesh is there. Uh, in the Islamic tradition, there is this idea that the spirit, which is our humanity comes later and the development of the, of the embryo. And so as at the beginning the embryo is not really a human being. The human being is only given by the, uh, by the spirit which comes after 40 days. It's just a symbolic number but let's say it's 40 days. And, but there are, there is, this, is, this, is, uh, this comes from the principle. And then there is another development which comes from the, the law, it's called the Sharia. The, the doctors and the, the try, to, uh, they try to elaborate by analogy to know whether this is feasible or this is not feasible. And here the consensus is sometimes difficult to reach because everyone wants to, to have uh, his own elaboration about those issues. But I basically think that there are no problems with uh, St uh, stem cells. In Islam, where it, it depends on what, which type of cells, stem cells, of course, but uh, stem cells which are taken from, uh, from tissue uh, of what kind of, there is no problem. I, I'm not an expert, I'm not a biologist, you know, so I cannot uh, answer too, too, too deeply too deep into a question. To a question. My name is Fred Schuren, I'm from Lundfern. Um, my question relates to the evolutionary principle, where we know that the principles of evolution go far hundreds of years indeed before Darwin, but Darwinism is still perceived by very many as representing a challenge both to the Islamic tradition and also to the Christian tradition. Um, where are we in regard to the Dar to Darwinian evolution, or indeed evolution of any kind? How do we address it this way? The basic statement I try to defend here is the fact that uh, Revelation does not speak of science, and that it's neutral with respect to science, and science is just an issue for scientists. So, in principle, Islam has nothing to say about the theory of evolution and uh, the facts. These are just facts and this is theory and this is science. But it's true that uh, uh, this opinion is not uh, the opinion of the majority in the Islamic uh, world. Uh, at the beginning, in, in the 19th century, when Darwin uh, wrote his books, they were very well received by the modernists in Islam and under the idea that uh, uh, Islam favors evolution because they, these people looked at the text and they, they found ideas which seem to favor evolution. Now we mostly have the opposite standpoint in the Islamic world uh, and there is a famous uh, preacher which is called Harun Yahya, you may have heard of him. He is a, 
uh, Turk. Uh, he has a lot of money to propagate ideas which are against evolution. So it's a kind of uh, intelligence design stuff, but uh, uh, in which uh, he accepts cosmic evolution, but he refuses biological evolution. And the argument is that uh, Darwinism was the cause of the, um, of the, of the development of materialism in the West. It's a poison. It has created all the problems of the West, all the, the ideologies, uh, Nazism, uh, communism, uh, colonialism, violence, capitalism, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And so it has to be, to be refused because of that. And uh, I was surprised to, when discussing to us with a philosopher, Dominique Latour, who is an expert in the philosophy of the theory of evolution, he said, oh, but this man is right. Unfortunately, there has been a lot of ideologies who, which used the work of Darwin just to, to, to settle their, their, their ideas. Uh, and now it's difficult to explain the theory of evolution in the Islamic world because of this kind of ideology. You know, the, the dialogue between Islam and science is polluted by ideological considerations due to the clash of the West with Islam in places of the world. And so uh, I hope that in the future we shall have the possibility to, to have a, a, a more peaceful dialogue because the, the most political, political issues will be solved. Yes, uh, following on from that, this morning, uh, in answer to one of the, the school children, you said that um, that when science uh, tells you something um, and the Quran tells you something different, uh, for example, about evolution, um, then you you should go and reinterpret what the Quran says. Uh, in other words, you should not take the, the words in the Quran literally. You should interpret them in the light of what science says. Yes. Especially because you can find as many verses which seem to, to favor evolution than verses which seem to, to be contra contradiction with evolution. It's, you know, you are, you are just trying to extract, to squeeze the verses to extract some meaning about evolution, but it's a, it's a difficult issue. And the, the, the standpoints of people are mostly ideological. For me, that's not a problem. I accept fully evolution. I, I, I find there is some grandeur, as Darwin said, in the perspective of evolution. And you know, this is, there is a story about the creation of the human being. It's created from clay and from God's spirit. Clay means that we share a lot with, with, with the world. We share a lot with the, the other uh, living species. So I'm not surprised that all, all our body, our matter, comes from a long chain of evolution. I'm not disturbed as a, as a believer by that. Uh, I, I fully accept that we have a lot in common with the chimpanzees, with other living species. On the contrary, I, I think it's, as a good gardener, I would like to be in connection with the, with the garden in some sense. And there is this mystery of a human being. What makes us different from the other animals? It's not reason, because we know that animals have, they have the capability to to, to do some, some computation. I've read amazing things about chimpanzees and their ability to memorize numbers. We, we speak, but all animals that speak too. So it's not a, diff a, a difference of nature, it's a difference of degree. And there is this mystery of the human being, of awareness of uh, the infinite, which is for me this spirit that God has put in us. And it is the capability that we have to, to contemplate the mystery of existence. But God can use a million or billion of years to, to make clay evolve, clay through codes. So that's a symbol to make life forms evolve and to give the, the spirit to, to a one creature. And maybe and this happens on other planets. There are so many planets. Can we think that they are all empty? I don't know, that's a, that's a puzzle. Uh, but, but when we discover life on other planets, um, what would your reaction be as a Muslim? I think uh, a Muslim would say, Alhamdulillah, that it's praise me, good to God.
Rory McLeod, Minister of Holy Trinity Church in St Andrews here. Professor Givadoni, you make a winsome case for the constructive contribution that Islam has to make to the issues of our day. Yet it seems that there are some significant obstacles, namely where Islam is weak, a tendency towards aggressiveness, and where it is strong towards defensiveness. Are these perceptions fair, and uh, how do you propose that they are resolved? The, the, the bad parts of, of Islam, the aggression, the defensiveness, um, what's your reaction to that? It, I think we, of course Islam is, is not a monolith. There are 1.3 billion Muslims, so people who are influenced by the Islamic culture, as there are 1.3 or 1.2 billion Christians, and or people influenced by Christianity. That makes a lot of different streams and different situations. And what we see, what we highlight in newspaper, is the fact that in several places of the world there are so many social and political problems that the only uh, outcome of that is, is violence, is terror, is war. And that's a pity. And these people who are facing strong difficulties use Islam as an ideology for, for, for struggle. And that's, of course, terrible for Islam. But it's something which is quite recent. It just has a few decades. Uh, since during all the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, there was a steady motion of Islam towards modernity which has been stopped in some places now by a globalization that doesn't work very well. But we can hope that in a generation from now, 20 years from now, 20 or 30 years from now, we may have a different situation. I don't think that this is in the principles of Islam that we find this violence and this aggressivity. Uh, even if there is violence and aggressivity in the, in the text, you have this same violence in other texts, and you know that you have to interpret them symbolically. So this is this idea that we, we have to, found, to find again, the idea that we have to interpret the texts symbolically as we fight against ourselves. And uh, it's something which is going to be difficult. And we cannot expect that all this and the world is going to uh, go ahead uh, in the same way. There will be places probably where it will be easier. And I guess that in the West, in Europe, in the United States, as well as in other places, such as, for instance, Morocco, or places in the Gulf, or Singapore, or Indonesia, where the, the problems, the political problems, are not too strong, this Islam for the 21st century will be able to, 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 to emerge. And, and it would be good if um, contact with forces of moderation and peace, you know, in the West, uh, that this can help this process. Yes. Um, yes. Robert Wilson, and the, uh, you, you explained the, the metaphysical basis uh, for school was an important thing in the new land. And in the last interest of dialogue with, with uh, Christianity, does that metaphysical basis provide an area of discussion uh, in relation to Christianity, which uh, itself probably has some kind of, <coughs> some kind of metaphysical basis as well, perhaps uh, uh, similar to uh, the Islamic basis? Um, is that an area which would be helpful for, for discussion between Christianity and Islam? The metaphysical basis of Islam. So, so is it useful to have a, have discussions between Islam and Christianity about the metaphysical basis? I think we have to to accept ourselves the others. Of course, we can say let's learn how to be together peacefully. If we don't 
fight one with each other. If there is no war, that's okay. That's enough for us. It's, it's true that we, that we live very good already. But I think that uh, something new is happening under our eyes during this 21st century. That's globalization. That's globalization and it's changing uh, things. Uh, it's changing two things. It's changing our relationship with Earth as a planet. We know now that we have the ability to spoil the Earth and that we, we should have to face very difficult decisions in the forthcoming years if we want to save the Earth and to save the humankind. We should have to change our way of lives. Uh, we should actually have to change our relationship with nature, with the others, with the poor. This is one thing. The second thing is that we have, we see now religious minorities everywhere in the world. There is this coexistence of religions. That is a completely new fact with respect to what happened in the past. And this is a duty for dialogue too. This is a duty uh, for a, a mutual exchanges. And, and now I think that we have to go one step further. We should, shouldn't, shouldn't say only, okay, don't, we don't fight between Jews, Christians, and Muslims and that's enough. Of course, it's necessary that we have to learn and to how to, to, to love each other, how to understand each other. And for that, we have to uh, accept ourselves as, as uh, revelations of the same God. How can we live peacefully if we are certain that our neighbor who is not of the same religion as we are will go to hell because he does not worship the good God? This is nonsense. This is nonsense. We should, we should accept uh, this unity of religion. Uh, and for that, we have to speak about theology. We have to speak about metaphysics. We have to speak about spirituality. And not only on uh, political issues or uh, issues of uh, diplomacy. And that's a challenge of the 21st century because uh, we are not prepared to that. Most of our theologians are not prepared to that. Most of our fellow believers are not prepared to accepting that even if the other religions say different things about God, about reality, uh, these different things ultimately converge on, on top of the mountain. And that's a big challenge for the 21st century. Uh, Renate Fitzroy, Vincent Pandos, freelance translator. Uh, my question is, uh, of course now, with all the violence that has happened, people will always be hurt, and it will take generations, I fear, to have all these wounds healed. And there are initiatives also, for example, by, uh, I'm just thinking of the Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, who every year invites a group of Palestinians and a group of Israelis uh, to France. And for the first week, uh, they just uh, remain, each group concentrates on themselves. And, uh, become very conscious of their own sufferings and only once they've understood their own sufferings they are brought together with the other group and then they're able to accept that the other side suffers too. So that is one way of approaching it, but it's getting more and more difficult every day that all this fighting, suicide, bombing and so on goes on. I think more people will get hurt, and it will, I mean, it will take much more effort, and it will be so difficult to build or to heal all that. Yes, you're right. We are, we are preparing, we are preparing the future. We are sowing seeds for the future. And maybe we shall not see the, the, the trees or the fruits of these seeds. Because it's a long-term history, but I think that we all feel that the future of humankind is somewhat linked to, to the relationship that we shall have with other faiths, 
Otherwise, we, we shall spoil and destroy the planet completely. So we, we cannot accept that. And we have to, to prepare the dialogue for the next generation of human beings, for our sons, or the sons of our sons. And all the initiatives are good because we don't know which direction the things can go. And we, we have uh, examples of people who are doing good and trying to, to, to meet with people here. There are people who are praying, there are people who are making lectures, conferences, uh, travels, and we have to prepare that, and especially to, because there, currently there are, there's so much violence on behalf of, uh, I mean, in the name of religions, in the name of God, that the danger is that people will, will be upset with religions, and they will not accept religion anymore. And we have, we, we must uh, protect religions against uh, uh, this opinion. So it's a, it's a long term uh, a journey. And a very important one in which we have to continue, I think, to be hopeful. Yes. Fine. Well, I think uh, time has come for us to have a, a vote of thanks now from um, Alan Torrance. Um. <coughs> to pick up on a comment you made in answer to questions, the central exhortation of the Christian faith is that Christians should love their neighbours, but not just their neighbours, their enemies too. To love is to desire to understand, and indeed to represent people right, fairly, truthfully, and accurately. As Dr. Bidadoni's paper hinted, and extremely graciously I may say, but as everyone in this hall is profoundly aware, the history of the so-called Christian West has not always reflected such a desire for fair and accurate mutual understanding, and we reap the consequences. Dr. Gibadoni's informative and lucid lecture could not have provided greater impetus toward a vision of shared community in particular in this instance, the shared and scientific or academic community. And he's done this by articulating the extent to which the Islamic faith, in common with the Judeo with Judeo Christian theism, serves to underpin the scientific endeavour by offering an account of science's presupposition of the intelligibility of the contingent order, the regularity of its laws, and the existence of a moral universe. A presupposition or a necessary condition of the existence of a scientific community. Dr. Peter Pidagoni, it has been a privilege to have you with us, and as a token of our heartfelt appreciation, I'm delighted to present you with this James Gregory Medal.
uh, by uh, soon after, uh, say, 10 past 7, because there's an orchestra rehearsal here, here starting at 7.15. Thank you very much.